Welcome to this week's episode of Top Lines and Tales, your weekly livestock podcast. As always, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Harbo, for their kind involvement. Uh, welcome to another episode of Top Lines and Tales, and this week I have with me, uh, some would say, one of the best stockmen of his generation, uh, Hugh Dunlop from Ayrshire. There, Hugh, welcome to the podcast. Hi Andy, thanks very much. Uh, it's been, a, I guess, an honour to be getting asked to do this. I've listened to a few of them. And uh, Hugh, where's, where's home to you originally? Where are you from? Originally, we, I was from a dairy farm, Miller Shield Farm at Drongan in Ayrshire. Uh, milked about 70 cows, Ayrshire cows at that time, but now moved to Whole House Farm at Ochiltree, where it's a beef a beef herd. Okay, and there'd be quite a few uh, Dunlops in Ayrshire, it's quite a quite a common name there. You, you, you're from that sort of family there with the sheep and all the rest of them? There's quite a few Dunlops, but a lot of different families. Okay. Uh, there's no many of the Dun... I'm not, I'm not related to many of the Dunlops that are known for sheep and... And but uh, my early days that I'd remember you with would be uh, across in those good old halcyon days down there in Smithfield, and I think you had a bit of good grounding working with uh, what we'd, we would call the legendary Ian Anderson. And Ian was some teacher, was he? Yes, I, would, I moved down to Rushmore with Ian uh, in oh, April '87, I think. Be there for just short of two years, so that was a great working experience working under Ian Anderson, and who was owned, it was owned by Robert Montague. Of course, and and I remember chatting to Jim Goldie one day, and he said that Ian Anderson has trained probably the three best stockmen of his, of their generation, and that would be yourself, uh, Brian Wills, of course, and Charlie McLean would all be there at Rushmore under Ian at that time. That's right. Yes, I I, uh, I would be there first. I think Ian went himself maybe the year before, and then I went down for a couple, just short a couple of years. And then when I left, uh, Charlie McLean and Brian Wills was good friends with the two yet mm-hmm. to this day. Uh-huh. And of course, uh, Rushmore would have turned out some good pedigree cattle back then, pedigree Charolais and pedigree Aberdeen Angus, and that would give you a bit of good grounding, I guess. Yes, aye. Uh, it was a great experience because when I was just from a small dairy farm, mm-hmm. beef cattle were a bit alien <laughs> to me at the time. Um, Charlie cattle were, th- in these days, Charlie cattle were the breed, the pedigree Charlies of course. down in the south of England. There was big numbers at every show that you went to most weeks mm. and it was it was a great accolade to win at the, up, the top end of these classes. Certainly, and Ian would be a man that would be looking looking at animals with a with a critical eye for good end and good shape, and obviously that's what stood you in good stead. We move on to when you moved into the fat stock show, show world yourself. Yes, I well, it's probably I'm not just sure when I started. I think I'd maybe had one or two at the Young Farmers Rally just before that, can probably kind of mid eighties, uh, and just get a kind of notion of the beef cattle from there. Um, uh, Ian was, you know, knew most breeds, uh-huh. and he was into this commercial world as well so it gave you a great encouragement it was a great help and a great encouragement to me over the years certainly and, and a great and a great accolade had been there and done that already and earned his spurs at smithford along with those great stockmen back in the in the 70s along with the, the likes of jim mckechnie and, and uh, john lascelles they were they were legends in their own lifetime weren't they ah uh, yes yes they were. they were the only one i they were kind of stopped before i started showing at smithfield but you'd always heard about them saw the pictures saw the photos read about them, and you knew they were the ones that were up at the top. Uh, if you wanted to be up at the top, you had to be working the same way as they were working. Mm-hmm. So when would you first be down there at Smithfield, then, with cattle? First year I'd be there with my own cattle was 1993. 93, OK, and I think you came came there with a bang, from what I remember. And, and, and you brought... Well, the first the first year, it was a homebred Lummy Bullock, and called my, that's my boy, he won the Junior Steer Championship and the King's Cup. In my first year there, Kings Cup in your first year. That's a, that's a pretty good accolade, and obviously it goes on from there. But let's go back a little bit to the to those early cattle. As you said it was a homebred one, and that's something that you've you've been renowned for. That you don't just go to the sales and pick them up standing around the sale uh, and beating against everybody else. You, you, you're the one, that, the man that uh, we started to breed them from an early age. And how do how you go about that? I mean, it's not an easy task for these youngsters listening mm-hmm. nowadays. It's no, no, it's not it's definitely not an easy task. There's a lot of problems come in the way as well. But I would have said, well, that the mother of that wee bullock was actually one of the ones I'd had at the Young Farmers Rally, and she was a Charlie heifer, mm. uh, and it just worked for them. And of course, when you date with your first heifer and you get a, a good beast like that, you think, oh, this is easy. <laughs> But it doesn't, it doesn't always work that way. <laughs> and you, as you said, you've been in that job, and there's one or two, quite a few people at it now that are doing that. They are buying these show cows and then putting them back in calves to breed more show cows. But uh, as you said, that comes with its problems, doesn't it? Yes, aye, definitely. I think it's actually getting harder. I don't know why, whether it's the Maya starting. Mm-hmm. The, I've had a few folk has actually phoned me about the Maya starting, like vets and things, because, well, you do get problems with 
mm-hmm. sucking in tongues and calving problems. But whether it's that, there's no prov- proof mm-hmm. what causes it. But mm-hmm. um, and, it's hard work. And you built you built your numbers up, I guess, with your with your few cows that you got there that you carried on turning out to um, breeding mm-hmm. breeding show winners. I think, and you know, you weren't long before you were back there having another go. Uh, it was uh, well. I didn't get shown much again till '94. Uh, Ian Anderson judged the at Smithfield, so uh-huh. I couldn't get shown that year. Okay. And then when come back in '96, we were champion uh-huh. with uh, I'm your man. I'm your man. That's right. And he was a, he was a man as well, wasn't he? I remember that beast uh, very very well. And uh, and you bred him as well. Yes, he was bred from a heifer that we bought. From Wendy Payton, uh, Maggie May. Okay. Uh, I saw her at Smithfield when Ian judged mm-hmm. that year in the classes and really took a liking to her. And she didn't win then, then she went to Thainson. Mm-hmm. So I followed her to Thainson and we were luckily enough, well, luckily for me, she didn't win. <laughs> so I bought her that day mm-hmm. and she was, it was actually, it turned out to be her only calf because she took Listeria right. three months after the calf was born in Worcester. Okay, as I yeah. said, some of the problems that come with that. And, and let's go to the male side of it for a minute. I mean, you'll be using mainly Limmy bulls, but it's not just any any Limmy bull that breeds a show calf, is it? You'd be, you'd be no, picking your bulls. The, these early days, it was always Shat and Pedro that clicked okay. with these Charlie Cross heifers. Um, and he'd done really well for me. But over the years, well, it would go out of fashion and you look for different things. But it's mostly AI. That I do anyway, I'll be 90, 95% AI, so we're always trying new bulls all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what, what sort of numbers of cows do you run now, or are you up to, or are you back down to? I'd be about, well, back, probably down, back down a bit, I'm about 105 now. Okay. okay. Um, they're all beef, beef bread, there's no dairy influence in them at all now. No. As I said, that when you start getting the numbers up, that's obviously when you start getting more and more of these animals and some to sell. But let's just go back to your to the Smithfield days, because as I said, everybody would feared when you came through the door there. You got to, you got a reputation that went before you there, Hugh, and and you, and you weren't long. You came back there and won it again. Yeah, uh, I it was it was some of the best days. Well, I'm glad that I got. I was lucky enough to get a chance at the Earls Court Smithfield, and it was about ten years ago there. But it was only every second year, right enough. Mm-hmm. That, I uh, 2002 would be the next time where a heifer would actually bought a Charlie heifer from John Robertson, a Logie Rate. Right. Uh, lip gloss. That's right. She was champion that year. It's it, 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 No, she was ginger. She was ginger. Okay. Uh, the yellow, the yellow Charlie. Uh, that's my, my preference is uh-huh. to the yellow Charlie. Still, right still is, and that's what people listen to this course will know you for, is the yellow Charlie. And then uh-huh. eventually we went on to, so I think what everybody would say, one of the best beasts, and I've had 100 people on this podcast now, and it's often a question that gets asked to people, one of the best beasts you've ever seen, and that was uh, Dancing Queen in 2004, and she was something special. That's right. Aye, aye. She was, right for the day she was born, we knew she was something special. Uh, she was always one of these beasts that always caught your eye. And I remember Alistair Vance coming in one day, um, and I was showing him around the cattle, and she was away doing the field a bit, and he just he just, he just spotted her right away, just a head in her lugs and whatnot, and he goes, what's, what's that? And he's wigged in shirt accent, which I'm not very good at doing. Uh, and... Of course, I explained to him that, oh, he just says, oh, Christ, what, nobody's got a chance this year, but there's a long way to go between the summer and the back end. Anything can happen. They have, and and, and it's it's an art as well, not just breeding them. Of course, breeding them is an art, but it's an art, as, as all, again, people listening to this will know, that of feeding them, and it's all about the timing, isn't it, getting the feeding at Aye. the right time? Mm-hmm. Aye, it takes, there's a lot of planning. It, if you're breeding them, you're really working a year in advance, yeah. really. Can the ones that are born the year before you're starting to look and pick them out and working with them just to try and get them to go the right way. But uh, it just it, it doesn't happen overnight anyway. And what sort of age and weight would Dancing Queen have been, just for our, our overseas listeners, just so they can sort of work it out? Dancing Queen was 606 kilos at Smithfield. She was 13 months old. She was born at the beginning of November and shown beginning of December. Mm-hmm. And she was 606 kilos. But she was a Charlie by Alan Ford Vagabond, she was out a Vagabond. of a Charlie cross cow. So there was a double Charlie in her. Okay, so she was at Vagabond, that's right. Of course, Vagabond's another legend in the cattle world, and we've had Archie, on, the, Archie on this programme before, and he just seemed to click breeding those show calves, didn't he? Aye, aye. He was the man in Scotland at that time for breeding the show calves. They would have lines and lines of Charlie Heffers mm-hmm. at these shows and sales. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's right. He would. We've seen pictures of him having fifteen or twenty in the in the in the in the Cali and Sterling, and then them all, all going on to Smithford and all all coming out with tickets. So uh, that's right. It was tough aye. competition, wasn't it? He wasn't just. Uh, he didn't just waltz in there and win it. People. That oh no, <laughs> no. Uh, and these days, well, 
Ken Archie would have, say, 15 calves at the Cali, mm-hmm. but it was quite often not the one that won that came out the best one. Mm-hmm. That's the thing. Uh, sometimes that's the hands that they go into and the, and, and the special yes. people that they get to get hold of them sometimes, as you uh, said. They uh, change, don't they? Oh, they change. Mm-hmm. They change all the time. Right. It's a bit of luck as well. And the, again, it's no, you need the luck for the beast to be right on the day and the, to suit the judge mm-hmm. and nothing to go wrong. And, but the, the, what I always liked about you guys, I mean, is when you came down, you literally only bring one or two animals. You didn't come turn down with a team hoping to hoping to try and get in through the back door or any any one of the classes. You literally came down with one and, and, and win it. That was always the envy of everybody, I think. Aye. Uh, that, that year, the Dancing Queen was probably our biggest year. I think we had four that year. We had three heifers. They were all shardly coloured, but there was one of them was a limmy sire, and they were all first prize uh-huh. <laughs> in the classes. Uh, they, were, aye, they were a great team of cattle I had that year. It just... All went to plan. And the Dancing Queen was never shown before. She was, you take the gamble and didn't take her to the Winter Fair. Sure, sure. Uh, and it did pay off that time. And, and sadly, of course, that was 2004, was the very last um, Smithfield show in Earl's Court. And what an institution that place was and the atmosphere and everything about it was just phenomenal. Aye, aye. Right, right from the minute you were leaving Scotland and these double-decker attacks, mm-hmm. it was just the buzz mm-hmm. of the whole thing for there to lead in your pride and joy up that back ramp into Errol's Court. Uh-huh. And then when you went in, getting the shit, the ball, you know yourself, it was empty. There was just the stalls and they were just starting to put the, the stands in and it was like a big open space and the cattle had been tied in that lorry for a wee while and you're just thinking, your heart's in your mouth, just hoping that they, <laughs> they behave themselves. But aye, most of the time they were fine. I've been on both sides of that camp, as you know, because originally I took cattle down there in the 70s and 80s. Uh-huh. But by the time you were coming down there, I would be one of the stewards on the ramp, opening the gate and letting the animals in, for, ready for the vets to inspect. And I saw Dancing, uh-huh. I saw dancing Queen from a thousand paces. As she just, she, she just, I didn't know about her either, but she just came out there and she was winning up the minute she came off that lorry. I've, a lot of folk have said that uh, after hand, like speaking to people, and they say, oh, there was a lady I spoke to, she was from South England, and she said, I just happened to be in the right bit, I saw her coming off the, up, she, was, she was up in the top in the double-decker, uh-huh. and she said, I just saw her coming down the two ramps, down to the ground, she says, I went, turned to my husband and says, that's the Smithfield champion. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, good and came out in the best clothes and I said there is an art to do to, to doing all that and, and congratulations on that but you did go on and win Smithfield again I think um, when it moved away did you not? Uh, yes uh, I think that would maybe be 2010 mm-hmm. maybe it was one of the years at Peterborough Okay. Uh, she was a black lady heifer from, called Tinkler Major um, she had been shown she was shown as a calf uh, the year before, and the, uh, no, it's, there was no, I don't think there was a Smithfield the year before, she wasn't at Smithfield then, it was a calf, and uh, she just kept doing everything right as well, right through to the end. Makes you into a very elite club there, uh, Hugh, four times Smithfield winners, I think there's uh, there's not many people that can, can be in, involved in that club, if any. Uh, well, I, I don't know, the McPhersons are bound to be up in a bit there, I would have thought, Donald and Ewan, um, they were... It was probably a lucky time at the time I was there because there's no such thing now. I, I've, I've got um, the lists here, but I, I, I would say probably maybe John Lascelles might be the only one that's run won it four times as, as, well, oh, right. as well as yourself. Right. I think you and and, and, uh, and Donald will be shouting at the radio going, no, yes, we did win it, but I think they uh, think they maybe only managed three. But uh, it, ah, it's, right. a, it's a huge thing. As I said, you've got everybody, every fanatical, and the same as it is now. I mean, the, the crossbred job is still hardly fought these days. We've got every, uh-huh. every fanatic in the country all turning up wanting that accolade and 400 cattle and just to keep walking in and winning it. I think you might, <laughs> you, a uh, little bit of jealousy might have gone around but uh, <laughs> credit, credit to yourself and, and, and the grounding before you. And, and uh, Thanks very much. And then you did go on, I mean, you sort of stopped showing them, if you like, but these yellow heifers still keep turning up, or yellow steers keep turning up at these shows, and and, uh, and that's from your breeding still. You've still got those those cows and those lines uh, still doing it? Yes, I still get the same lines. Uh, we've actually showed a Charlotte heifer last year uh, at the back end shows that was from the same line as Dancing Queen. If you go back a couple of generations, they had the same okay. uh, mother. Uh, so the, the lines are still there. Mm-hmm. And you always thought it's hard. I don't know why it's getting harder to get a ginger mm-hmm. Charlie Heifer. But when you do get one... And it's a good one. It's always a right one. Everybody loves a ginger salad. I'm, I'm right in thinking that uh, um, it was a few years later, I think, that uh, Drew Hislop came in and uh, and, and won again with one of, of your breeding. Last I won. That was Smithfield as well at Peterborough. That's right. uh, what year would that be? 
2013, okay. Bang Tidy, that's right. Bang Tidy, right. that was another great looking beast as well, I think. Aye. When I look Aye. back to the records and, and, and look at Dancer Queen and what have you, that that, that one came up there pretty much uh, looking Aye. special. Mm-hmm. I remember seeing it in the flesh and thinking that was... I think she, did she not win the double? I think she might have won the, the, the winter first. No, no, she didn't win the winter first. She won her class, but she didn't win champion. Mm-hmm. Uh, so she was probably much... De- well, everybody wants to win when they're there, but Drew would be fairly happy she didn't at the finish up because she got the, the Smithfield title at the finish up. Yeah, so. yeah another great accolade. And, and I remember going back the way you selling, oh, it would be, maybe was it when you sold I'm the Man, I'm selling for something like 7,000 and you got yourself into Texel Sheep buying a few gimmers there. So, uh, That's right. I, I'm Your Man was 10,000 actually. To me in these days was a hell of a money. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I did, I bought a couple of Texel gimmers from Garn Gower mm-hmm. at the time. So we had a dabble in that for a wee while. Yeah, uh, but no, I just didn't. I didn't manage to hit it off the same. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Difficult not to crack that one as well, and they're uh, getting really. harder too. Uh, no, no, I don't have any of the pedigree texels now. No. Uh, just didn't commercial sheep. You still run a few sheep, do you? Aye, uh, just commercials. Okay. Yes. And, and I, uh, one day I remember being in uh, maybe Carlisle, perhaps, uh, and you looking to buy a bull and bought a bull with a big, uh, with a big rear end on it, looking to buy a bull to breed these show calves. And uh, again, how, how do you, how does that happen? You know, how do you go and go and pick a bull that's going to click with these uh, big ass cows? <laughs> Very difficult because yeah. uh, you don't all win, right? And kind of, you, you don't win them all. What you buy, you know, the best cow and the best bull in the world, and it still doesn't breed you. Mm-hmm. I show one, so that's where a lot of luck comes into the breeding of the commercials, I think, anyway, because there's as much, they're no true pure bred, bred. there's other breeds and yeah. other crosses in them. Yeah. Uh, that would be, I take it that would be Robin, the Robin Gurkha, was it? It was a Robin, about? Bull, was a Robin, Aye. Bull, that's right, yep. Aye. Uh, I had him for a few years and he'd done, done all right, actually, mm-hmm. and then I sold him on to uh, Gordon Cameron. Okay. And and you have now. I mean, obviously, if you've got a hundred cows, you've got to, hopefully you've got a hundred calves a year. You'll be you'll have calves, show calves to sell. And we'll go on to your your family showing them themselves at the moment. But you'll still be selling calves each year. Is that all? Just people coming around knocking on your door, or do you, do you put? Uh, I odd ones that way. It's it's pretty difficult to sell show calves if you're showing some yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, for a few years there, we didn't show very much, so I was selling them. But it was more like James Nisbet, Drew Haslop, uh, mm-hmm. Jennifer Haslop. They were coming and buying them privately, but. No, Stuart and his girlfriend Penny, are, I've got the bug. Um, it's pretty, I, I don't believe in keeping your two or three best ones and selling your next string as show ones, if you know what I mean. It um, becomes a dilemma, I, doesn't it? I seem to remember Archie, yes. Archie having the same conversation when he's sort of showing him himself and selling them. You just, you fail, you're keeping the best and robbing somebody else. It's, it's, a, aye, it's aye. a dilemma. I, I think Archie would probably get away with it because he was selling, was it, did he sell the females and keep the bullocks or was it the other way round about? He'd done it for a few years. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but Stuart and Penny, they just went the two, two or three. They've got them picked, and then the rest. Of, I, I show some of them just at the local stores like Lanark or Stirling, mm-hmm. uh, just in the at store sales, commercial sales, and they work away. I've got quite good buyers for my commercials mm-hmm. now, anyway. So, but. I probably I'd keep telling Stuart if he wasn't the into it, I'd probably make more money if I sold them all rather than keeping them for showing. <laughs> You've got to encourage them as well. You do. And is he in the family business, Stuart, in the family business himself? No, no, really, no. He's a joiner. Uh-huh. Uh, he's got his own business, uh, custom joinery, uh, him and another chap. So they're pretty busy with that. But he's here every night. And if I need a hand through the night for carving and things, he's, he's only a phone call away. He's pretty good that way at coming. Coming up and giving my hand. So you're bringing the cattle out and feeding them for him, and he's taking the glory. That sounds a familiar story. <laughs> well, he did, I would, well, he, he's here every night and he does all the work uh-huh. breaking them, leading them, tutoring them, washing them. Uh, he's even clipping them now as well. Mm-hmm. So he's, no, he's doing a good bit of himself. No. I certainly, certainly saw him at Livestock last year coming out with a couple of good cattle and, and, and winning a class or two and just getting picked for champion, if I remember right. Aye. So he's doing the job, mm-hmm. right? I I had a good girl last year, the big heifer that was she won her class at I Scott and then she was reserve champion at the Welsh Winter Fair, oh, okay. which was good to get because it's no easy going to beat the Welsh in their home <laughs> turf, but to get just about there it was good. Yeah. No, I've, I've fallen into that trap this year with my sheep. We'd won the other two, the England and the, and the Scottish one, and then uh, fell foul of the, the, on the last hurdle at the moment. <laughs> I don't know exactly how that is. And just going back to live, Scott, well, I say the Scottish Winter Fair, really. I mean, it, it's had a, a number of different disguises, the Scottish Winter Fair, but you've always been, well, you've been involved in that from a committee point of view, I think, and a stewarding point of view from, from for a while. 
I have been, oh, God, there must be about eight or ten years I've been on the committee, but I've been out through the vice chairman, chairman, and chief uh, steward, chief beef steward now for the last two or three years. So I am very hands on, been very involved in it for the last few years. And it's been to, not without its problems, that one as well. I think you've had a few homes over the last few years as well and sort of been up and down. And it's uh, for, for the what should be the premier fat stock show in, in Scotland there. If, uh, it must be hard to try and keep that thing going. Aye, but it's always, when you're renting places uh, to hold an event like that, there is a fair bit of cost involved. Uh, it was, a, well, it was originally at Ingolson, I think the very first year I showed was at Ingolson, then it moved to Perth for a, a few years, uh, and then it moved back to Ingolson, which probably was a good place for it, a good central place, but the expenses just got too much for it mm-hmm. as well. And then New Atlantic, I would say, it's really going from strength to strength at Atlantic, and I've included a pedigree carve. Mm-hmm. section in it as well which was well supported last year and by the talk it is going to be very well supported this year I, I was at that, that event in Lanark this time and I thought what a, what a brilliant event it was and it was nice to see that show sort of coming back if you like and as you said with all the, 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 the pedigree calves in there as well and, uh, and I think because there's the Stars of the Future show that's on before it I think perhaps you put in the, the pedigree calves if people are going to get them ready for one show then they've got two, yes. another sh- show to take it to so. uh, that's right that's, that's the kind of way we were thinking right enough and with a couple of other people that are on the committee that are quite into the pedigree calf side and they were saying that as well if the calves are ready for one show what's the difference between them to another show mm-hmm. and, and is mm-hmm. it uh, is it harder to get to judges these days I suppose there's a lot of youngsters out there but it's finding the right judge to, to suit that job without pulling the butchers in uh, well you get you get two sides to it because the, the Christmas time they always think it's a, some people say it's a fat stock show so they should be Killing animals, mm-hmm. which I can see both sides of it, but I'm a wee bit older fashioned and think they still need to be show cattle. Mm-hmm. Uh, if they're show cattle, they need to be right in their legs, character and very correct. But quite sometimes these cattle are not the most fleshiest, mm-hmm. True. but they're the most correct. So there's two ways to look at it, and I can see both sides of it. Now, now we are kind of trying to date like a kind of butcher, showman turnabout mm-hmm. now mm-hmm. to try and please, to try and suit everyone's tastes. Certainly, the, the the beast that was winning it there last year from Craig and Team Malone was uh, that was a show beast and a butcher's beast, wasn't it? Yes, I that was. Uh, there's nobody often you see a Charlie Bullock as good and as good a show cat beast as that, and it just and that was a, he was put on as a butcher judge. We thought, but yet he probably picked the the showiest beast as well. Yeah. But it's been doing very well with everyone the way it works, but you don't. It, it doesn't happen every year. He wasn't just a butcher, though. Your, butchers, uh, your, yes. your man was, was also a pedigree cemetery breeder, wasn't he? So, yes, and still is. Actually. You're one of the top guys in, in, in that section. Uh, well, Hugh, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you today about some good old days. Uh-huh. Before we go, I'd just like to thank all the folk that have helped me over the years to get to where we've been. Uh, obviously, you need help, and there's quite a few folk. There's one person I'd like to mention. I know a lot of folk will know him, but he goes with a nickname, Tubber, mm-hmm. who was my kind of wingman or my my gopher get to when we were at Smithfield. Uh, one of these people that always managed to, if you forgot to go and get your hair straw, so he seemed to manage to acquire it for somewhere. And still managed uh, to get a bit of crack too. I remember Tubba well. You tell him I was asking for him. He's uh, he a good lad. Aye, aye. <laughs> okay, I was tell you, the year that he was, one of the years he was there, he, he was walking about in the hard and he started getting a bit scattered in the nether regions. <laughs> and we decided, our Lynn had said to him, Oh, I'll get you talcum powder. So she got on that. But after that, every step he took, it was like the powder puff man. There was a white <laughs> step every week. <laughs> he had never been left Ayrshire, so it was all big for him. And uh-huh. first year he was on the plane, it was like a scene for Crocodile Dundee. He was sitting sweeties as if they were getting out of fashion. <laughs> I know, there were some great characters about there. And I do bang on about this, obviously, far too much. And the youngsters going, we should stop talking about those great days because they weren't there. But uh, everybody helped each other. And they still do in the business, don't they? Aye, everybody mucks it together. The straw's coming and your, your neighbour's not there. You go and get him a bale and, and make sure Aye. that they sort it out. And I think that's the camaraderie and, and the uh, and everybody in it together until you get in that ring, really. And I think that's what, mm-hmm. that's what makes that's what it's about. It makes all showing, but certain, the commercial Aye. showing is slightly different because the commercial showing you're all in against each other. It's not necessarily Aye. about the breeding and, and, and selling. A, a lot of the a lot of the commercial show commercials are. It's like a hobby to everyone. Yeah. It's not the same pressure probably as the pedigree world. And they, but and some folk maybe do put the pressure on themselves for the price of some of them are now. <laughs> nowadays there's big money involved. There is, there is, and, and sure, as yeah. I said, when you're breeding your own there, that's actually, you know, there'll be as much money in that and probably as breeding as breeding pedigree. Uh, that's much the same, but much the same. And it's good to see there's quite a few young people 
getting involved in it and a lot of good stockmanship amongst the young younger generation, which is a lot of females as well. A lot of females Fem- as well. I think uh, yes. you, you would be one uh, to put a female on the front of the halter if you could have a chance and I think that does, I, yeah, that does it, make seem- if, if the beast's quiet enough and well behaved, I a, a female does have. Well, we've, I've always had a female judging them until Stuart started doing it. <laughs> uh, yeah. But but his girlfriend, she, he's she's come into it and she's quite good at it as well. So it's quite handy having a wee blonde sometimes. <laughs> 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 we'll say no more on that front. Hugh, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you. And as I said at the top of, the, of, of this programme there, that uh, renowned, but for my generation anyway, to be one of the greatest stockmen of your generation. And you've proved that in, in, in what you've won. And uh, wish you all the best going forward. And uh, we'll catch up with you for a beer one of the days. Thanks very much, Andy. Thanks very much. Great to speak to you. Cheers, Hugh. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Top Lines and Tales. And uh, as always, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Harbro, suppliers and manufacturers of quality livestock nutrition and nutritional advice. And uh, at this time of year, there'll be a lot of you out there getting the tups ready to bring them out for shows and sales. Uh, And make sure that you consider the Harbro Clover range of pedigree feed, which includes the market-leading Maximum Kelso Tup and Lamb. You can find more information about Harbro's products on their website and on social media. And while you're on social media, don't forget to have a look at our Top Lines and Tales Facebook page where you'll find information and some photographs to back up this episode and other episodes. Thanks.